You're listening to The Diplomats Podcast on Asian geopolitics. As always, I'm your host, Ankit Panda, here from New York City. And uh, today I'm delighted to be joined by a special guest uh, who's just written a terrific book. I'm very pleased to have with me on the show today, Anit Mukherjee. Anit, how are you doing today? Thank you so much, Ankit. It's really good to be on the show. I'm doing well. Thanks for asking. Thanks for uh, making this work across several time zones. Uh, For our listeners, Anit is calling in from Singapore, where he's based. Uh, He's an assistant professor in the South Asia program at the S. Rajaratnam School of International Studies. Uh, And Anit, we're obviously uh, very happy to have you on the show, and in particular to talk a little bit about your excellent new book, uh, The Absent Dialogue, Politicians, Bureaucrats, and the Military in India, which I had a chance to spend quite some time with over the last few weeks. And, you know, to begin with, uh, I just wanted to ask you to just introduce yourself a little bit to our listeners before we jump into the book. I I usually like to have our guests talk a little bit about uh, what they're up to and uh, what their interests are. So obviously, uh, given the topic of your book, we know that you're interested in civil military relations in India. um, But what else uh, are you uh, working on these days? Um, So I think to to take a step back, I think it's a good idea to talk about who I am and why I did the book. So um, I was in the Indian Army, I served for about eight and a half years. Um, And um, during that time, I I included uh, some years, uh, about four years in Kashmir. And I thought I got intrigued in the question about military effectiveness because I was finding out that there were certain problems. I think as all junior officers have certain, and I think it's a good trait, have certain elements of unhappiness with their military organizations. And inevitably, the the answer I used to hear used to talk about civil military relations. And that's what intrigued me in the topic. Um, And so that's why when I left the army, um, the intellectual journey I undertook was to look at Indian civil military relations. And is it really the cause of um, the lack of effectiveness of the Indian armed forces? Um, But apart from this book, I'm also interested in India-China military competition. I'm doing a co-authored book uh, with a colleague at King's College, Walter Hadwig, on Indian defense policy. Um, So yes, in short, I'm interested in all matters pertaining to Indian strategic studies. Terrific. Uh, well, you know, let's get let's get right into the thick of things uh, with your book and the topic of civil military relations specifically. Uh, so, civil military relations are, you know, it's a, it, it's a field that's not particularly well understood outside of the realm of folks that really study it. So, just for our listeners who might not be on the same page, succinctly, could you just tell us a little bit about what exactly the value of studying civil military relations is when it comes to understanding a a polity and a defense establishment like that in India. Uh, what what exactly are we talking about when we talk about civil military relations in this context? Uh, so the book examines the interaction um, between politician bureaucrats and the military. So in a democracy, which is classically defined as one where you have firms will in control over the armed forces, um, this is the apex element that shapes most aspects pertaining to defense policy, right? It is the job of the elected politicians to tell the soldiers to A, go to war, to tell when to stop fighting war, um, and also to give broader instructions on the objectives of the war. So um, so in some ways, it's the crux of where most important decisions pertaining to war, how, uh, when to fight a war, how to fight the war, uh, when to end the war um, are actually made. Um, and so... In that sense, um, the book examines this interaction in the Indian context, which is the interactions between people who have been elected at the prime ministerial level or at the cabinet level and those within the Ministry of Defense and the military headquarters. Right. So one of the one of the chapters that I, I enjoyed quite a bit was the uh, early one where you walk through uh, the historical development of civil military relations across some of the early Indian governments. And it's and it's really interesting. I mean, you know, reading reading this book uh, in, in the back of my mind, uh, I would you know often think about naturally comparing India's experience with civil military relations to that of India's neighbor, Pakistan, certainly. And uh, I think in the post-colonial context, it's been interesting to see how civil military relations have evolved and developed in, in many of these post-colonial polities. And India is really, I mean, a success story in many ways, right? I mean, Indian democracy has survived against many odds, including a sprawling geography, a chaotic politics, a, a highly diverse country. And the, and the role of the military in that mix has been remarkably successful. And I think your book sort of talks about that that trade-off between civilian control and effectiveness. And I mean, it's, you know, 
it's 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 quite clear, I think, from your analysis that uh, civilian control in India perhaps has erred too much on the side of assertive control, leading to negative outcomes in assertiveness. But how well has the Indian army really done in terms of staying within its lane uh, as far as Indian democracy is concerned? I think on that count, uh, there's much to be kind of proud of, right? I mean, the fact that we have attained firm control over the Indian army or the Indian armed forces is an extremely good achievement of Indian democracy. Uh, but actually, I move beyond that. And I think uh, you're right in arguing that, look, um, I think it has come at a cost of effectiveness. And if you look at other, other, other countries, once they have attained firm control over the armed forces, uh, uh, the conversation then sh usually shifts to questions of effectiveness and efficiency. And in India's case, I think it's only now that we are having uh, some, al some element of concerns about both effectiveness and efficiency. So to answer your question, I think um, that um, if you look at the conduct of the armed forces, they've basically stayed in their lane more or less all the time. They haven't stepped out. Mm -hmm. And when we when we talk about the historical experience, how much of this can really be attributed to uh, the efforts under India's first prime minister, uh, Jawaharlal Nehru, who was very much a man concerned with uh, so-called coup proofing in India? Could you tell our listeners a little bit about um, you know the the banner efforts that uh, India saw under under Nehru at the time? So uh, I think to a significant extent, um, the immediate years after independence were the time when we did not have firm democratic roots, right? So it was a very crucial time. And I think if you see the experience of other countries, this is when in other countries also all across the world, democracy started to uh, fall. Um, so I think we should give a lot of credit to the India's, uh, to India's first prime minister for establishing firm civilian control over the armed forces. He played a really important role in um, giving prominence to the Ministry of Defense. Now, to a lot of people, this bureaucracy is a is a is a pretty new type of bureaucracy, right? I mean, the first one that we know of was established in uh, well, it was established all across the world. But MOD as a bureaucracy in in kind of historical terms is a pretty new concept slash establishment. The MOD in in the UK, for instance, was established in 1964. In Brazil in 1999. In India, it was established in 47, um, but it did not really. Uh, so there was a lack of clarity about the powers it will have vis a vis the Indian Armed Forces. And I think the role of the first PM in this uh, in this regard was extremely important, where and he basically told them that, look, um, all the work that should be conducted should be done through the Ministry of Defense. Um, so in that sense, I think we should give him a fair degree of credit. But again, I think to a certain extent, he overcompensated. And again, if you look back upon it, it was understandable at that time, right? I think at that point of time, you could have asked fair questions of would the army take over? There was a lot of speculation, even in the West, right? Even till the mid 60s of when would the Indian take over control of the Indian state? And so there were all sorts of rumors, diplomatic notes floated by the Americans and the British predicting that the army would step over, it would step in and take over control of the Indian state. But I think by the 70s onwards, the, especially after the emergency, I think um, Indian democracy had struck much firmer roots, right? So now it is as inconceivable for the Indian army to take over power as it is inconceivable in, let's say, the UK or the US, right? I mean, you could speculate about it. You can make movies about it. You can, you can, um, you can perhaps even uh, talk about the. Um, if you look at the democratic institutions, and it's not just the parliament, but the free press and um, other institutions, it's it's taken such firm roots that it's highly inconceivable. Um, for uh, the army to take over control. So uh, I think uh, that is to the credit of, again, not just India's first prime minister, but also those who came after him. And also, I think we should give credit to the Indian armed forces themselves that took a mm -hmm. really strong stance of saying, we are going to be apolitical, right? right. We, are not, we, are, we are not going to be Pakistan, right? So, and they took a stance of saying, 
whatever happens, we will not get involved in um, interfering in, in the democratic process. Right. So, you know, speaking of giving credit to the people that came after him, um, something that I found really interesting in the book and I, I learned quite a bit from was your appraisal of Indra Gandhi's record. Um, it was actually pretty eye opening to see um, not only her relationship with the Indian military uh, during, for example, um, the early 1970s and 1971 in particular, but also after the war, um, the the interest that she took in military affairs. So some of our listeners, you know, might be more familiar with Indira Gandhi's more controversial record, certainly during her tenure. You, you briefly mentioned uh, the emergency and uh, other other controversies around the time. But she seemed to have learned a fair bit uh, on these issues um, from her father and, and certainly had her own role to play. Tell us a little bit about how you view Indira Gandhi's uh, time at the top in terms of the broader story of civil military relations in India. Uh, so two things. One is when I talk about how Indira Gandhi learned um, by accompanying her father and her father's failures, I've been accused of, well, aren't you propagating dynasties then, right? I mean, <laughs> isn't it a good thing to have dynasties? So I want to be a little careful here. Uh, no, I think, and it was an eye-opener for me also. I think the simplistic assumption is Indira Gandhi let the Indian army have a completely free hand during the 71 Bangladesh war, and that's why India won this glorious victory. Um, and I think um, when I went into the papers and I looked into it, and I think that's an overly simplistic understanding. Indira Gandhi uh, was a very good uh, people's manager. She could read people really well. Um, and although a lot of people, um, I think, kind of, uh, kind of criticize her for destroying institutions associated with the Indian state, and I think that's a fair argument to be made against her. But I also think um, she actually got along well with her military commanders, but especially before the Bangladesh war, she actually worked with her civilian advisors to work the military to, to kind of sort out its plans, right? So I examined the roles of officials like K.B. Lal, who was the then defense secretary, D.P. Dhar, who was her advisor, P.N. Haksar, and I saw evidence of how they were actually forcing the military to have joint plans together. So if we look at the 62 war, which India lost, it was blamed on the civilian interference. So as a consequence of that, the 65 war with Pakistan, the civilians basically stayed away from the operational domain. But that did not really work well in the 65 war. So from 65 to the Bangladesh war, you actually saw instances where there was organizational and institutional like the learning within the services and the Ministry of Defense. And so I was um, I was surprised at the role that Indira Gandhi took and the interest she took in the affairs of the armed forces. Um, and so in my assessment, I think she was the best wartime kind of leader that we had, in part because she kept going back and asking people of how prepared is the military, what is it that they need, are they coordinating among themselves, are they talking among themselves? And so she kept in touch with them and she took an interest in the in the affairs. Um, in a way that very few prime ministers did. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So moving moving past the uh, historical appraisal a little bit uh, to more contemporary issues. So one of the issues uh, that comes out strongly in the book is this you know negative correlation between high levels of civilian control and low levels of military effectiveness. And one of the things that's interesting in India and actually I think several other um, similar post-colonial democracies perhaps is the fairly low level of expertise in the civilian sector about anything related to yeah. the military, really? You have a very low mm -hmm. level, mm -hmm. uh, you know, for, for example, military veterans are not a large mm -hmm. number of legislators in India at any level. So there's just a fundamental misunderstanding between the folks that are, for example, appropriating funds and, and, and setting out yeah. procurement agendas and then the military as the end users. So this is something that certainly can be approached with institutional solutions. And you, and you talk about some of the attempts to um, sort of rectify this in India. How, how, how can this be bridged? I mean, how do you develop proper civilian expertise on military affairs in a, in a polity like India? That's a great question. Um, well, I'll say three things to this. One is, I think the importance of such expertise is only now being acknowledged by the academic literature, right? And I think in part because this is not a real issue in the U.S. context, because the U.S. has a revolving door policy. It also has a policy of declassification. It also has a policy where the academic programs like in MIT and where I went to school at SAIS, which actually study strategic studies and are able to groom 
people who can then actually gain some expertise and authoritatively engage with the armed forces, right? So because it's not an American concern, I don't think it's got enough attention, but it has only now been identified as an important part. So there is a growing body of scholarship in South America, even in Europe, which is talking about the importance of such expertise. Two, um, I think people underestimate of how you need to create the, the proper incentive to create such expertise. So it's not just about politicians who've served in the military, but actually, let's say, academics or analysts who can make a career of living of strategic studies and expertise. And to do that, you need to create opportunities in the sense, you know, you need to ensure that they can teach at your war colleges or they can make a living out of it or they can go into the security bureaucracies, into the Ministry of Defense, if you will, or the National Security Council or MHA. Um, and I think for both of those elements, in India's case, it does not exist. And third is, I think even important is issues like declassification, right? I mean, it's, it seems like it's a small thing, but I basically argue that, um, that unless bureaucracies declassify their primary documents, you cannot create civilian expertise because it basically means that even in India's case, I've been arguing for a very long time that the Indian military and its bureaucracy, the, Ministry of Defense does not really have a proper declassification kind of procedure. So we do not have officers who are, let's say, exposed to primary documents about any of the historical wars. I mean, 65, 71, 62, IPK of operations. And so if you're not able to get these primary documents out, you cannot have academics who learn about it. So huh. in some ways, this is a devil. Uh, it's, it, it, I mean, it's a real issue. And then Finally, we get into the administrative structures of the state, right? I mean, if you have a generalist civil service as you have in India, then they kind of move around between different bureaucracies from, it could be completely un, um, unconnected, like uh, highway ministry or agriculture ministry, and suddenly the next day you're dealing with aircraft carriers, right? That does not make sense. So I, uh, I argue that, look, India needs to have a dedicated defense administration service so as to speak that that looks at or it can go around in between the national security council the mha and the ministry of defense that 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 encourages such expertise right can i can i actually ask you a little bit more to about the declassification issue because i just find that fascinating I'm, I'm very much interested in sort of declassification issues in the united states so how does that actually work in india who makes the decisions on what is to be declassified um, so how does that actually get done at the end of the day? Short answer, it doesn't. <laughs> Short answer, there is no bureaucratic procedure that I know. Short answers, and I've been arguing about this. Um, so I faced a classic cash 22. Uh, I mean, it's just a simple law of bureaucracy. If it's nobody's job, the job doesn't get done. So there is nobody whose job it is in the services or the Ministry of Defense to actually declassify, who, who can actually sit down and look at the papers and have an... So in the U.S. context, there is a proper procedure where there's a historian, an analyst, and a serving person who goes through the papers and then says, you know what, this we can allow to get it out in, into the public domain, this we need to do redactions on it, and these are the things that we need to actually redact, and then we can, of, in India's case, this procedure just doesn't exist. And I faced a classic cash 22 because um, I, I mean, I was, I felt very passionate about this topic, and I didn't, um, did a couple of, uh, I approached people within the services in the military of, you know, why don't you declassify your papers? And they said, we are willing to declassify, but the Ministry of Defense has to pass instructions to us. So I went to up to a senior official in the Ministry of Defense and I said, why don't you pass the orders to the armed forces to declassify? And they very glibly answered, only the classifying agency can declassify. And the classifying agency in this case is the military. <laughs> So it was a perfect catch 22. And in, I mean, inside my head, I was like, wow, I always heard about a catch 22, but here's a perfect one. I mean, hats off to the brilliance of both the civilians and the military to pass the buck on this issue. Right. And, but I think it, a, I think it not only hurts the development of strategic studies in India, but I think it does an injustice to the men and women who have served because we are not able to honestly tell the stories and tell the stories of their sacrifices. And I think it also masks a certain underconfidence, which I don't think is, is required. I think India has much to be proud of after independence. The Indian Armed Forces has, has much to be proud of. And, the, and these stories should be told warts and all, because only from 
only if we let these stories be told will we learn from them. And so I'm not uh, I'm not attacking this issue from the left. I'm actually attacking this issue from the right, that unless you declassify, you will actually create the same mistakes over and over again. So it's actually I'm questioning why we don't declassify from the aspect of military professionalism and military effectiveness. Right. I mean, in order um, not to repeat history, you have to actually exactly. study that history. So that makes yeah, sense. Yeah. So where do these incentives so, come from? I mean, if, if there is to be reform in India on many of these issues that you identify in your book, where do the uh, who has the incentives to actually begin rolling this massive boulder up a hill um, and actually getting some of this stuff done? Um, I'm sure you were planning to get into this afterwards in the conversation, but um, there's a lot of uh, significant um, institutional changes occurring in India right now. They just created a chief of defense staff mm -hmm. and other bureaucracy. So what we are seeing now is an unprecedented institutional kind of reforms happening now. Why is it happening now in the second term of prime minister kind of, of Modi is a very interesting question. I don't know the answer to that. Right? I mean, um, but I do think that that India is at the cusp of a transformation. So um, there are move institutional changes occurring now, which can actually fix a lot of the problems that my book talks about. And so that is very encouraging. But what is a little um, I'm a little cautious about is how do they go about doing it? So so for the first time we have had after a very long time, a prime minister who seems very serious about fixing problems in the defense sector. And so I don't know whether he'll be able to sustain the interests, if they'll be able to make the necessary changes and talk about these sort of issues, right? Because nobody's talking about declassification as yet. I don't think they're talking about all the bread and butter issues that my book talks about. So um, as as you've gone through the book, there are like five empirical chapters that look at five internal processes, like weapons procurement, defense planning, um, officer promotion, officer education, and jointness. And in a nutshell, these are the bread and butter issues that go at the heart of military effectiveness. Uh, but all of them require some serious attention, and I don't see elements of that as yet. Um, but hopefully with this, with this, with a, it's a new attempt at defense reforms, hopefully it'll be sustained that um, they'll be able, actually able to get down to the brass tacks on this. So I'm a little hopeful on that, mm -hmm. um, but I think I'll be able to more confidently get back to you on this about a year from now. Right, right. One well, way or another. Well, I mean, uh, you know, let's drill down. I mean, before we uh, come to a close on this conversation, I did want to ask you a bit more in detail about the chief of defense staff uh, reform, uh, which is, of course, uh, General Bipin Rawat, the former chief of army staff, certainly a big personality uh, these days in uh, in Indian Indian security circles. And in fact, I mean, reading your book also, you know, the role of personalities and all of this, I think, really stood out to me as well. So, I mean, what is your assessment of the actual um, value at the end of the day the chief of defense staff can have? It's a, it's a non-command role, but he's he's been charged with some kind of very big picture issues coming out, you know, when it relates to the Indian military. But what is um, on on the chief of defense staff? What is on his plate, first of all? And 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 how well is the CDS reform going to address some of these issues pertaining to the absent dialogue in India? Uh, two things. One is I think he's I think when they made the announcement of creating a kind of Kind of creating a CDS, this was welcomed by most analysts, right? I mean, this is a long-standing, long-pending demand from those people who have been saying that we need to create a chief of defense staff. It's coming even from the 1960s onwards, even from the late 50s onwards, there was a demand for a chief of defense staff. So this step has to be welcomed. Mm -hmm. But when they created the announcement, there was a lot of skepticism from, in, I mean, including me of saying that, would they just make it a, a figurehead, right? Or would they really truly empower the office? And I think on that question alone, I think they've really created an empowered chief of defense staff. And I don't think any of us expected um, the chief of defense staff to give be to be given as many powers as he did. So apart from creating a CDS, they also created an institution called the Department of the Military Affairs (DMA), right, which is uh, an unprecedented, unheard of um, idea, right? Because I have looked into this issue for the last 10, 15 years and nobody, and I have not come across to the best of my knowledge, any scholarships that talks about the DMA, right? And suddenly they've created a department of the military affairs, which will be headed by the chief of defense staff, but which looks at all matters pertaining to the military, including the three armed forces and the Coast Guard. right? And I, and I think um, this is very, very significant because uh, this, gives a lot of pause to the CDS. And I think you're seeing that sort of 
institutional engineering happening now and he's been also given an explicit mandate to create theater commons now all right. of these are things that um, a lot of the reformists including me were talking for so we are cautiously optimistic but uh, what we are a little um, at, or at least i'm a little apprehensive of is how does he go about doing it because this is going to be a really it's a very large military with a lot of challenging um, you know uh, terrain environments um um uh, 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 theaters to kind of operate out of um, uh, and the way he's and I think apart from him saying that we are not going to ape Western models, we don't have too much of clarity on it. And so, um, I mean, among the things I've been arguing for is that the CDS should come out with a vision document of how he thinks he's going to live his next two, three years in terms of the institutional engineering that he's going to bring about. Um, and it should not just be interviews, but it should be like something more substantive um, than um kind of interviews with, with journalists right right well anup thank you so much for taking some time out of your day to uh, join me to talk about your book today thank you so much for this opportunity ankit i really enjoyed it absolutely and uh, for our listeners once again that was anit mukherjee at the s rajaratnam school of international studies he's the author of the absent dialogue politicians bureaucrats and the military in india published last year it's a excellent look at civil military affairs in india unlike anything else that comes before it so anit congratulations on a great book and i hope to have you back on the show to talk about uh, indian security affairs in the future i'd love to come back at any any point of time thanks for the opportunity Great. Uh, so for our listeners, uh, make sure you subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss future episodes. You can do that on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, or any other number of podcast providers out there. And if you have been a listener for a while, but you haven't yet left us a review, uh, please do that. We really appreciate that. It also helps new people find the show. Um, so please do leave us a review. We really do appreciate those. And finally, before we close, a note from our sponsor. This episode of the Asia Geopolitics Podcast is brought to you by Diplomat Risk Intelligence, or DRI. DRI is the consulting and analysis division of The Diplomat, the Asia-Pacific's leading current affairs magazine. Since its launch in 2002, The Diplomat has been dedicated to quality analysis and commentary on events and trends in Asia and around the world, and is now one of the most respected publications covering the region. DRI inherits this approach and offers clients in the private, public, and nonprofit sectors worldwide access to an exclusive network of subject matter experts and analysts. Whatever your needs in the wider Asia-Pacific region, DRI can offer the knowledge and expertise necessary to anticipate and manage geopolitical and geoeconomic risks. For more information, please visit dri.thediplomat.com. Thanks a lot for listening, and we'll be back next week with more.